You're good. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for showing up at this late uh, time of the day. I'm sure we're all a little bit loopy. I'm, I'm a little bit loopy. So I'll do my best to try not to put you to sleep. I do. Unless that's what you desire. I can, I can also not put you to sleep. That's what you need. <laughs> but I will do my best not to. Um, we're here to talk about the Beaver calendar system. Um, have any of you downloaded and tried Beaver at all? Uh -huh. Oh, cool. I'll be interested to hear about your experiences and what you're looking to do. Um, before we even start, is there anything specifically you're really interested in about the book? If it's general, that's, that's fine. Is it? Yeah. General. general? Okay. Uh, public events or personal events? Personal calendar. Again, a bit of both. A bit of both. All right, here we go. So, all right, the Beaver Enterprise Calendar System. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit about where we're from, what's going on with the, with the people involved. And you can't have a beatwork talk without talking about calendaring standards. You just can't do it. That's what we do. <laughs> and uh, so we will talk, touch a little bit on the state of calendaring today, historically and where we are today, and talk very briefly about calendaring standards. Make your eyes glaze over if I can help it. And then we're going to talk about beatwork. All right, so I am Arlen Johnson. I'm a senior web producer at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, I won't read the rest of that because it's a mouthful. And uh, just a quick piece about RPI, if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, it was apparently the nation's oldest technological university. We like to, to tout that. Um, and that's uh, on Rensselaer over there. We're in Troy, New York, which is near Albany, if yeah, you're unfamiliar with it. And when we got involved in this project, Project, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but uh, we we wrote this quote in in a description of why we're getting involved, uh, and Rensselaer relies heavily on and benefits mightily from open source software. So Selden contributes to it. So we believe that this contribution will enhance our reputation in the area of software development. And two of our goals, as we wrote, were that we wanted to uh, leverage our expertise in Java and web client interfaces and we wanted to avoid becoming calendar experts. That was a big old oops on that because a decade has passed and we have definitely become calendar experts. And I, I would pause for a moment here and, and say that I'm sure that for many of you who've worked in IT for a long period of time, the uh, wonderful inside joke is, you know, how hard can that be? Anytime somebody actually utters that phrase, it's, it's always a quick look to the side for us. Um, it's usually followed quickly by I'm sure you'll come up with something creative. Well, I must confess uh, to having said that to myself. It's like, oh, calendaring, well, how hard could that be? <laughs> Holy moly. Once you get down into the depths and guts and gore of it, it is incredibly arcane. And I'll, I'll talk about some of that without getting too deep into it. But it's, it's uh, impressively arcane, and it's neat uh, how we got involved. So onto this. Every good audience ought to question the person who's speaking. And the question to me would be, all right, so he's up here talking about calendaring and calendaring standards. What gives me the right to actually speak with authority on that topic? Well, primarily, let me take a look at all the contributor, contributors who have been doing this for about a decade. We've, we've been deeply involved in this for a long time. But I also wanted to point out that the, um, that the chair of the, of the steering committee, Gary Schwartz, who I work with at, at Rensselaer, and uh, Mike Douglas are both deeply involved in CalConnect. Um, Gary is currently the president of the CalConnect um, Calendaring and Scheduling Consortium, and uh, actually is also on the JSON Board of Directors. Mike Douglas, who is the chief architect of Beadwork, has at this point um, authored a number of, of standards you know, through OASIS and the IPTF um, for calendaring. And these are standards that are used across the board by, by industry and by us. So um, when, we, when, when I speak to some of the issues that are going on in calendaring, I'm talking from a very, uh, very high level across the, the entire industry as best as I can for today. So uh, to that point, uh, the state of calendaring. Once upon a time, if you've ever been to one of these slideshows from me before, I love showing off this slide. I haven't shown it in a while, but I showed it probably six years ago at a JSA conference. Mm -hmm. And I like to show it again today. Because things haven't changed 
that much, unfortunately. They are changing, though. Once upon a time, people would look at their calendaring environments like this. So you have a situation where you've got um, somebody working with Exchange at work. They've got uh, a laptop running Windows, running Outlook and all that. But maybe they've got, in this case, it's a trio. But it could be an iPhone. Over here, we've got an iPod and a PowerBook at home, all of which is also being synced up with Google Calendar and everything else that, that they want to do to try to to uh, assemble their entirety of their, their calendaring life all in one place. They've got conduits that they have to run through, all sorts of crazy synchronization going on. Unfortunately, a lot of us still have to live a little bit in this. If you're running Exchange over here, and you're using Google Calendar over there, and maybe you've got that work on one side, that's the way things have been. However, this is the future, and it's already here. Um, Pretty much, as things get more CalDev aware, and I'll talk a little bit about CalDev more, um, two-way sync is going to become the norm. So what you do is you use your client, you hook up to the various servers that you want to hook up to, and all your calendaring information comes right in. That's already happening. Um, that happens in VMware. It happens on, on Apple's iCal. And uh, if you're new to CalDev, the analogy I like to use for people who are new to it is you think of as email is to IMAP, um, CalDev, uh, well, calendaring is to, is to CalDev, right? So any old client you want to use, it's just that calendaring happens to be 10 years behind. There are also a lot of other, you know, behind email. There are also a lot of other complications that get involved with calendaring, as you'll see. But the future is also common. We're getting closer and closer to this. This is the holy grail. What we want to be able to do is do cross-organizational and uh, uh, scheduling and cross-platform scheduling, right? So maybe. Maybe this guy over here at Organization A is running Exchange, and Organization C is running Oracle, and Organization B is running Beaver. Yeah, all right. And uh, they want to be able to schedule a meeting between themselves. Well, that is, that's going to be happening uh, pretty soon. Uh, it's already been proven, we proved that this could work years ago. Um, but then getting that to be accepted across all of the different uh, vendors is, is, and, and calendar server creators is the, the next step, and it's coming. So why? 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 Why do I go on about this? Why does it matter? Well, it turns out Boeing did a, um, did a study some years ago, and it found out that it took 21 uh, person hours to schedule a single meeting across its organizations. That adds up over a period of time. So you always have to wait overnight, and these things usually involve you know, trying to schedule with somebody, they get back to you and say, well, that's not going to work, and you do it again back and forth. We still do this. We have phone calls. We send emails. We get stuff back. And scheduling these meetings is tough. So um, we need to be able to set up these meetings across organizations as well. So if you're outside of Exchange and you've got two different calendar systems, we need to be able to actually pass this information around. Things like the smart grid matter. If we want to be able to schedule when entire buildings are going to use certain uh, use energy, right? And we want to be able to put an entire city or many cities on, a, on an intelligent uh, power plan, then we need to be able to, to schedule that stuff. So appliances need to be able to do this kind of schedule as well. And obviously, just the most obvious, we want to be able to keep our own personal lives the same. So when from a public event standpoint, which of course people is heavily invested in, we want to be able to subscribe to, the, the, to events that we're interested in and have those things show up right in our, our, our device controls. So all right. So quickly, just a couple of slides about calendar standards then. I spoke about CalConnect. It's a calendaring and scheduling consortium, and it's really focused on interoperability between cal calendaring systems and uh, clients. And one of the main things they do is interoperability testing. So they will get together several times a year. Um, I think they have two uh, conferences a year, but at least once a year they, they have a big gathering, um, and they do this interoperability testing where these folks, and there's some pretty big names on here, sit in and fire off events at each other and see whether or not their clients and their servers are going to work together. So, you know, we've got Apple and Google and Microsoft and Oracle and so forth sitting down trying to get their calendaring systems to work together. They said, we're very involved with this consortium, so we want to make, see this, this happen. Um, it's exciting stuff. And they, and here is what I call my quick litany of CalConnect projects, which I will not go into any detail in because this is what will make your eyes go over. That's exciting stuff if you're interested in, in standards. Um, CalConnect has facilitated the following. You know, 
they've upgraded the iCalendar uh, uh, standard and iTip scheduling and CalVab and so forth all the way down. Uh, Mike Douglas, who's the chief architect for VWork, had a, had a very serious hand in writing the WS, uh, you know, Cal WS REST and SOAP standards and so forth, um, as well as WS Calendar. And things that are very close to happening. Uh, CalDev sharing, so that I can just pull out my, my iPhone and say, hey, I want to share my calendar with you. Boom. I invite you, you receive a notification, you say, yeah, great, and now we've got a shared calendar done. That's already implemented in VWork. It's already happening on another major vendor. And um, it's going to be a, a standard that we have recognized as part of CalDev coming up soon. Consensus scheduling is a really cool thing. Who's used Doodle? It was awesome, right? We're looking for a standard way of doing that, so that's being worked on now as well, and so forth. So there's a whole lot of other stuff going on here. Uh, time zone services, running like DNS. Right? So you've got some master servers, um, and, and, and stuff gets propagated down into a site that you can, you can look at uh, to look up time zones, because time zones are remarkably complex. They're political, right? It would be nice if just based on longitude. It's not. <laughs> so. Things that are coming, uh, stuff like auto discovery for devices and appliances, CalDAV alarms, so that, that stuff will, and so forth. Lots of other things happening here. So that's the stuff going on with CalConnect. Um, why do we get involved? Well, for one thing, we just, just, we've discovered that Rinso Lear, a very small organization relative to some of the other organizations that are on that list, can have a big impact across an entire industry. And that's been that's been exciting for us. And and it's it's good for Rinso Lear. And it's it's Good for us, you know. It's it's good in many ways. Enlightened self-interest. It's good for our project as well. We know that if we're sitting there working on the standards and talking to other people about making these things work, and we're trying to write reference implementations of that stuff and making it work, then we're pretty well guaranteed to have our stuff work on their stuff. That's very very helpful. All right, moving on. Enough. Let's talk about people. So Beaver the project quickly. Beaver is a standards component, right? I just went through a whole bunch of standards. Open source comprehensive calendaring and events system. It is it's an Imperio community source project. It's platform independent. It runs on Java. You can download it and stick it anywhere you like. It's um, we, we run it in, in JWAS, and it is obviously if I haven't drilled it home uh, hard enough, it's standards based. Did I said standards yet? Okay, so. So it's been 10 years in the making. Um, March of 2013 marked our seventh anniversary of when we released the name Beatwork. But actually, for me, it's, it's interesting. This kind of goes back a decade for me. Um, I first visited the UW uh, University of Washington about their UW calendar project exactly uh, 10 years ago, August. Um, my wife was seven months pregnant with our first child, and it was a busy 10 years for me. So I started this project before I had children, and now I have three. So, and I find myself back in San Diego, because I also came down that year to go to the SIGGRAPH conference. So I thought it was interesting. It's been a decade here it. So, all right, beadwork then. We started off talking to the UW calendar uh, back in 2003. We released beadwork 3.0 in 2006 and won a Mellon Foundation Award. Um, we became a JSIG incubator project in 2009, became a sponsored project in 2010. Uh, in 2012, Aperio was born, and uh, in 2013, we're going to be releasing Beaver 3.10. Uh, we just recently released Beaver 3.9, um, and there are a lot of interesting things coming in 3.10, and 4.0 is also being worked on as well. A lot of people are using this product. So we've got Brown and Colgate and Notre Dame and Virginia. That's where all these folks, and there's a lot of other places using it that either we cannot name or we do not know. And that's one of the great things about writing open source software, right? Is that you build this stuff and lots of people come to grab it and use it and don't know who they are. Um, lots of uh, for profit enterprises use it behind their, their software as well. So, um, the steering committee are made up of people from Brown and Duke, uh, Public University of Navarra, RPI, Red Hat, uh, previously at Yale. Casco Online, previously at UW Madison, and Jerusalem Solutions. So we've got a pretty wide range of people involved. And a total calendaring system, as you're getting into calendaring, 
I've touched on a lot of different points, but there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle. When you talk about calendars with people, they might be thinking you're talking only about personal calendaring. Or they might be thinking you're talking about public events calendar. Or they might think you're talking about scheduling, right? Oh, I'm banging on the thing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much, we're trying to support all of this. It's a lot to try to, to do, but we're driven by the standards. That gives constraints, and we work on those. And also by feedback from our community. So where there are strong areas, that's where we get a lot of feedback, or people have potentially funded us, or, or there's been a lot of demand. Where there are lighter areas, maybe there's been less demand, but we'd love to have some. So we get uh, pushed the way most of us get pushed. So at your own organization, you can use your own database, your own local auth, your own language and culture, your own portal, uh, your look and feel, um, your calendar clients. You can integrate it. And it's not that difficult to install anymore. You basically download the Quick Start and run it. And that's going to get easier as 4.0. And interoperability is really a core value. And the reason we focused on this so far is we also recognize that at universities and a lot of organizations, you're not going to have one calendar requirement. At Ritzelier ourselves, we have an exchange for our staff, and we have uh, beadwork for uh, students and for our public calendaring environment, but we may very well go, like many people have gone, we might do Google, we might do you know, something else for, for the students. So we're going to have a lot of different calendaring systems. And so having those things work together so that we can trade information, say, with whatever vendor is selling you your athletic site, right, and their sporting events, getting that stuff into your calendar, that's important. You want that stuff to come in easily without a heck of a lot of work. So finally, I guess one of the other points we'll make here is it is our active participation in these, in these processes and standards building that really make this uh, project work for us. And that's that's So all right, enough of that. Beaver. So here are the features, the core features. And these, uh, these, these, these will start to go away soon, so I'll show you the actual pictures. But we've got public calendaring, we've got public feeds and widgets for sending that data, those, that event data, out into, uh, into portals, onto static web pages, onto whatever you need. Public events administration, obviously, and the ability for community members to submit events. We have personal calendaring, a CalDAV server that comes with it. Um, actually, it's a very fundamental piece of the, of the pie here. An API of, and with web services. We've got uh, a time zone server. And recently, we've been added Beaver Sometime, which is a uh, which is a uh, for scheduling uh, availability and improved calendar sharing. You now, like I just spoke about, uh, the ability to register for public events, um, a notification system, a system that we put Apache Solar in the mix as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, so starting with the public calendar <coughs> suites, you can make uh, beadwork look pretty much like anything you want. And I'll just give you a quick rundown of various places that have done it, such as Colgate running the Beaver Public System. University of Virginia is fairly new. We've got Rensselaer, uh, Vincent Brown. They've been running it for quite a while, running 3.6, I believe. Actually, they just upgraded to 3.9. They actually beat us to it. I was, uh, I was impressed. I was like, ah, we're going to get out first this time. You know, we are the developers. We can always manage that. <laughs> so sometimes we were actually a little behind. But we try to get out first, because there's nothing like using your own environment, your own organization as the, as the, the final large guinea pig before it gets out to the, to the, to the, to the masses. And Brown beat us to it. <laughs> I was actually very proud of them. It was awesome. A little smaller, uh, well, actually not so small, but uh, places up in, in uh, Canada. We've got Yale. We've got Bennington College, a smaller school. Um, we doing it quite well. We've got Duke, who uh, works with it. We've got the University of Chicago, who's been using it for a long time. Um, you can also create, of course, departmental calendars, because these, these, these pictures that you're seeing here are called calendar suites. And they happen to include all of the events, probably, in the school, or most of them. And these departmental calendars are really just exactly the same thing, filtered down to only show those uh, events that a particular department wants, and maybe skinned to be different. So here's our union events calendar, the same way. So it only shows uh, events of interest to students. We have a human resources calendar, um, which I'm sure people are flocking to. And we've got. Um, Events such as college fairs and school visits, which are not of interest to our on-campus community, but need to be promoted off-campus. So when people want to come for a visit, they can, or, or not come for a visit, but they want to see when uh, Rensselaer might be visiting their town, they can go and say, hey, I want to take a 
child or I hope to go visit with, a, with an admissions officer. So the VBRIC mobile web is is there. This on the on your left is a, uh, a mobile site built up at jQuery Mobile, uh, done by Duke. And on the right hand side, that is VBRIC uh, data that is being fed to an app at Pencil there. So it's easy to uh, to pull that stuff up. VBRIC comes with a basic mobile theme. It's a massive update. You can really stand to take in what uh, what what Duke has done. But it's been done, and um, it's really mobile ready. This is the theme widget builder, which allows you to select whether you want to have just a raw feed of RSS, JSON, ICS, or XML, um, or whether you want to turn it into a widget and then you just grab the code on the page like you would off of, you know, uh, off of Google or whatever, and you just slam it onto a static site. And it will output um, data feeds. Events. Um, VBRIC is fully internationalized, and I am going to be talking tomorrow about the internationalization stuff in VBRIC. Um, our approach to this is goes back basically to the beginnings of the project, and uh, it works very well for internationalizing the theme. And a point that, that although there are there from a development standpoint and a maintenance standpoint, there's some things I would really love to see changed. Um, it has worked very well, and there's not been a huge amount of demand for, for updating the way it works yet. I'm hoping that there will be. Um, we've got, uh, we already shipped with a couple of translations in uh, Spanish and uh, French. No, sorry, Spanish and German. Uh, but it's been translated to a number of other other languages you can see here. Inside of Prince of, uh, of Bieber, the content is all ready and has been ready for years to be uh, translated on the fly. Um, each of the events and the and the categories and the sponsors and the contacts and so forth are made up of, of fields ready to receive multiple multiple languages. Um, we just have them exposed to the digital. So there's work to be done and we want to see it. Event registration is a new piece where you sign in, you can ask uh, to register for an event, you have to, to sign in to do that obviously because you need account. And at that point, you can see a list of the people who are organizing that event can go and get that list of people. This is nascent. So we have yet to uh, do anything as complex, for example, as include credit card transactions. But that may come. Um, but it works pretty well. Public events administration, obviously. Theme resource management is new in 3.9. One can manage all of the theme resources, or perhaps system resources as well, because there's there's that as well, uh, from within the UI. And right now, that's also somewhat nascent, but um, it does allow your administrators. Um, you know, if you're a deployer, you don't necessarily want to set a bunch of files up for somebody to go and hack away at. You might want to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you check your CSS? Or why don't you do this? And it, it provides a certain level of control. Or if you want people to upload images, whatever, you can manage all that inside the UI. So that was just recently added. And for example, it allows one to uh, manage and change the, the triptych panels that you saw on a lot of the public UIs. Um, there is the public event submission, which allows any member of your trusted community that you've uh, included to, to, to submit an event for approval. Personal calendar. The personal calendar client is fairly basic. I would love to, to spend some time working on that, but it does a decent job. And again, look, there's not been a huge amount of demand to update this yet. I mean, the main reason there's not been a huge amount of demand for this is because people have better clients to use right on their devices because of Caldap. So you can go in and you can do various things inside of here, such as uh, subscriptions, which will some they also be available through, through here. Um, but this stuff integrates so well into your calendaring clients, whether they're desktop clients or your mobile clients and so forth, that, that you can bounce between them with ease. Um, so here's the work via CalDAV, actually. And it directly integrates. And, and this is such a cool thing, it's, but it's like CAS. You know, CAS is awesome. CAS is so great. But it's kind of invisible, right? Because it works. And when things work well, the user really doesn't. Right? So this is the great thing about, about Caldav. You put in your, your server address, you put in your username and password, and the next thing you know, your calendars are just working. And if everything works well, 
as it as it seems to with with uh, Beeper. That's it. That's all you have to know. And user goes about its business. So that's it's it's. I get very excited about it, but most people are like, what's the big deal with my calendar? It's just working. Well, good. That's what's exciting about it. It's just working. So, all right. Um, so calendar sharing, this, this new approach to calendar sharing is very simple. Once upon a time, one had to manipulate ACLs to, to deal with calendar sharing, and you still can inside of uh, the UI here by clicking on advanced options. I can show you that. But now all you have to do is say, you know, throw out a, a user ID, say what the suggested name of the thing is, and send it to them. The, user, the other user's going to get a notification saying, hey, so-and-so wants to share with you. And they can accept it or reject it, and the next thing you know, you've got uh, shared calendars. That simple, really easy. Here are a bunch of Cal, CalDAV clients uh, running Beaver. And all right, so I've got a couple about four slides of what Beaver architecture looks like, a little bit more closely. So this is the public system. So to give you just a very high-level overview of what this looks like, and I've shown these slides before, but they're, they're still very much uh, applicable. We believe in storing public events inside this big cloud of events. So it's just a bunch of events sit into a, into a, into a pool or a, a cloud, and there's no hierarchy in here. There is one calendar collection that holds all the public events that are then tagged and categorized as needed. And then what happens in the, in the calendar suites is that we build up a series of views um, based on subscriptions into this, into this calendar and with filters on them. And so we can then break this stuff down. And the data feeds simply go in and take a look, and then they do filters on, on these categories. So it's a, it's a relatively simple way of, of approaching this, but it gives us a huge amount of flexibility for producing the output that's meaningful to the user. Um, getting data in is through the Public Events Administration. And so users who are administrators are members of the group, first and foremost, inside of the Beaver administration. And uh, if, they, if they log in, they can see all the other events between the other members that their other uh, members of their group have created and can edit those. Right? They, can't, um, they can't work with other events from other groups, except they can cross tag them. So <coughs> if somebody sees an event, that they believe needs, needs to show up, say, in a, in a feed of their own, and it's not been tagged appropriately, they can actually go grab that event and tag it. So cross-tagging works. Submission works much, um, uh, works by allowing a member of your community to submit an event. They, there are certain things they cannot do. For example, they cannot set up a recurrence, because recurrence, recurrences are confusing to people who are uninitiated. <coughs> they then, um, Pass it in for approval. A member of, the, of an administrative group can see it come through and approve. The personal side of things is a little different. Each user has his or her own calendar hierarchy. Right? And so what you've got here is, um, in this case, they can, they can share their calendars together. Using this new sharing model, they don't have to manipulate ACL as much, but they can if they want to, and they can have pretty complex sharing. Or they can also subscribe to the public events inside of Beaver, or they can su subscribe to an iCal feed somewhere else. And by the way, if they do that, that stuff, and then go and grab it off the iCal server, it shows up here too. So it's pretty good. And um, there you go. Another way of looking at it is this. So where we've got um, everything is being is coming in and out through HTTP inside of the big Beaver system here, and you kind of have you've got JBus sitting down here on which a lot of these different services are running. Rely on JMS, and all of this stuff is uh, running back here, supporting what's going on with the web clients, but also supporting what's going on with Caldev. Those blue applications up at the top left are stuffed inside of this VW Caldev ear uh, file, and sits inside of Tomcat, inside of JBoss, and users' interactions are primarily through this. The web services go through the Caldev uh, uh, app, app, and over here on the far right hand side, we also have this URL builder and web cache, which can sit outside on a completely different server if you choose. It makes sense to put a cache on a different server. Um, but as the quick start comes shipped, it's actually all part of, part, part of one thing. And so there you go. If you have any questions about this, we can come back to it. All right. Some quick notes about the way WeWork has been used by other organizations. Now, Duke has taken WeWork, they've used it for a long time. 
and have recently implemented a whole a fresh UI on top of it based on uh, Apache Solar. So they've actually got Apache Solar indexing Libra, so all that stuff comes through Libra into Solar and out the other side. And they're doing <coughs> full faceted search here based on Libra commands, which is pretty wild. Um, so what we've got here is, you know, the typical kinds of things. You've got search by category. You've got students over here, and it's it's listed in from most to least order, like a lot of you know default passive searching is. And uh, we can take a look at that if you want to, but it's a neat way to use Beaver. If someone clicks directly on an event, it goes straight back to Beaver. But it's uh, I'm pretty sure I don't believe they're caching the event. That one, I think it goes straight back to Beaver. But I'll have to um, the University of Chicago did a lot of work of their own. Uh, taking B-Work and, and reworking some of the front and back of PHP. So they've been running uh, their own sort of uh, version of B-Work for, for quite a long time as well. B-Work sometime. This is a, uh, once upon a time it was called the Scheduling Assistant. It was uh, written primarily by Nick Blair of the University of, of Wisconsin-Madison. And the idea behind this, this is a very exciting thing, is it allows a faculty member, for example, to set up what office hour times are available and that they will allow someone to schedule with them. So they might say, I want to only be available to people uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 4, and I'm only going to allow two people at a time to schedule with me. So it has some, some complex uh, logic built into it to allow that kind of, of scenario. And then users can come can, can, can schedule with that, that individual, and what it does is it kind of does the scheduling behind the scenes. It says, oh yeah, all right, this person is open. We'll automatically accept those, and that stuff that goes into the calendar systems. So behind the scenes, this is actually working against real calendars, right? So it works against Beaver and Exchange and Oracle. And so what ends up happening is that a faculty member can set up their schedule at the beginning of the semester and say, these are no times that are unavailable. Or perhaps a counselor who wants to have people come meet with them, you know, more stressed. And um, and then they sit down in the morning and say, oh, is anybody scheduled with me? Oh, look at that. You know, John wants to come. He's stressed. Arlen's, Arlen's losing his mind today. So it's great. You know, we're, we're uh, uh, it's a neat thing to see. I, I wish I could actually demonstrate this, but I did not bring this ready to be demo. Um, I will just point out, though, that the scheduling assistant, as it was once called, needed a new name. And we sort of embrace it as part of the Beaver fold. Uh, it is a separate application that can run on top of Beaver, can run on top of, of a number of calendar systems. Uh, but we, we've dubbed it Beaver sometime, which I think is a very cool name. And uh, so that it sort of fits into this family of, of calendaring applications. Also, uh, EPFL took Beaver and wrote a new portlet for it. And they're going to be, I think, moving from 341, I think they moved to 338 in 2012, um, and did a lot of interesting work there as well. So Beaver is a platform for other people to use. So for example, we really think of the, the calendar server as being kind of core here. Uh, we have web services that come out, and you can have a whole slew of different kinds of, of applications built on top of that, in publication, travel booking, all you know, scheduling. So another view like here. You can imagine all kinds of calendaring applications built on top of these types of systems. Uh, complex resource scheduling, tours, I mean, have, and, and other kinds of, of applications. You know, stuff for the smart group, really, really interesting stuff come out of that. And there is this conceptual boundary of the applications sitting on top of the calendar core. And Beaver has built all of that in mind. Okay, a little bit about where we're going, and then I will give you a, a, a brief demo. One of the things that we've got that's already in, in place in Beaver are page, is a paged front end, so that if you've got you know, a long listing of, of stuff, you can just keep paging forward in time. Paging forward, paging forward. It makes a lot of sense from a public event standpoint. You just want to, oh, what's coming? Oh, there it is. Let's keep going forward in time. It does need to be re reworked because it actually conflicts with some of the other ways we do things. So, but it's there. It can be turned on now. Um, Multi-tenancy, also in place. The ability to just deploy a calendar speed on the fly and have it drop in and go. It works. It needs documentation, pretty much. Uh, improved caching. We've already, we just recently 
uh, stripped out what was a Ruby-based cache that was shipped with, with Vwork. Um, we had to we had to strip it out because as more and more people were deploying Beaver on Windows, we discovered that we had hit a file path link limitation, where we just couldn't you know try to save these ridiculously long paths depending on how many things people had selected. It starts building up, and it would balk, and so that the that what was written to disk wouldn't work. So we got that fixed and re-implemented this EH cache thanks to uh, thanks to Eric Whitman. Um, and so there are more improvements to come to allow for absolutely massive scalability. So we've already scaled this. We've got, uh, you know, UBC has been using this for a very long time, big, big place. Uh, San Diego Public Library has 37 branch libraries, runs their stuff around the clock, you know, and bazillions of events. It scales very well, but we want massive scalability, millions. So we're you know, also scaling down as well. So if somebody wants to say, says, well, this looks like an awfully big system. What can I do, you know? And we've had many discussions about how we can just kind of produce something a little bit lighter weight that you know, keep this easy. So even if you download the quick start, but you only pick the bits and pieces that you want to run. It's like, oh, I want this, and I want that, and I want this. There you go, you're done. So, um, and I know that there's been some discussion about moving to an OSGI to help with that. Um, fast search is coming. Multi-select fil filtering in the public UI, which is distinct from faceted search. So instead of just like picking all the stuff that are out of the facets, uh, multi-select allows you to uh, have somewhat more static mediums that are hierarchical, fixed in form, but that people can pick from and, and uh, filter. So we're going to simplify the administration of this stuff. There will be a no-build deployment, uh, meaning that Literally, you download it, you configure it through a web interface, it's done. Um, stronger internationalization, as I spoke about, and uh, more applications which are going to be exploiting VWork uh, as sort of the fundamental uh, calendar server underneath the hood. So, all right, let's do this. Do you have any questions? You know, I've been battling about calendaring for a while up here. Any thoughts? Questions? Let's see what we can. Okay. So um, I guess we'll start by just taking a look at the events calendar here. This is the just default uh, theme that comes out of, out of Beaver. And we've got a, a number of different ones to choose from. And there's a, a concept of an upcoming event list, which just simply says, give me all the events that are happening today and into the future. And this is stuff that can be easily paged and, and so forth. I seem to be in a mood for zombies today. I don't know why. Zombies and kittens. I think is a very good mix. So, Beaver has all of the social networking stuff that you would expect. Um, some of this has to be configured. You know, we suggest a share this approach, but you know, that has to be configured for your own site, right? And there, there are instructions on how to kind of put that stuff in place. Facebook links, Google links, and so forth. Hey, <clears throat> and uh, some of the neat stuff we've got is the ability. I'll show you this. This event registration piece. So, um, oh, by the way, you'll note that uh, I did find this on the web and it was uh, freely available, but I decided not to use it here just because the, the large version of it was off the web. So, if a user wanted to, to actually attend this concert and register for it, they would be first, they would need to log in. So, they need to be a member of your community in this case. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing and actually had done previously for one of our own projects, uh, is allowing for self-registration. So you might have that switch turned on or turned off, depending. And then the user can come to your public client. You can imagine going to San Diego Public Library, for example, and saying, oh, I want to attend this, but I have to register for it. But I don't have an account. Right? So you need to be able to self-register. But right now, it works with, with your community. So I'll sign in. OK. So I can register for this event now, and it looks like there are 397 tickets available, and I'm allowed to pick up to four. And boom. So I'll pick uh, two. Take me print, and I'll go out here. Register for that. Hey, great. Okay. So there we go. I'm now registered for this. If I come back here and I'm logged in, I can see that I'm registered. And um, if you use a single sign-on service such as CATS and so forth, you can bounce around between all these 
these bits and pieces that works quite well. This will work just fine inside of your portal. So, not um, one thing that we have tended to. It's been done. It's been done several times running beadwork as, as a portal. But we tend to suggest that you don't try to run a lot of like the beadwork web clients as a as a portal. We, we maintain that for a long time. To rather send in data feeds or use lightweight versions of stuff, or you know the, the stuff that's directly in uPortal, just feed that data in and then bounce it out to this, or use an iframe or whatever. There's a lot of approaches to handling that. Um, but anyway, once we've registered for this, I could use a list that I've, that I've got. Oh, great, so I'm on the reservation here. And uh, so I can unregister if I want to or, or change it. Uh, from the perspective of the administrator. I'll log in as administrator. Let's see, I'll log in as a super user. At this point, you have a pretty simple menu of items that you can choose from. You can add events, manage them, contacts, locations, and categories, or search for events that you need to find. Um, if I'm interested in the uh, the registrations for a particular event, I would visit that event here. Like, here's the zombie concert series. There are ways to filter that down easily. So maybe I'm really interested in the concerts. And there's the zombie concert series. Oh, by the way, if you've seen Beaver before, which I know one or, only one or two of you have, this is much improved in the way in which that you, you manage getting around inside of the, the events. Because if you have hundreds and hundreds of these events, you want to be able to find them quickly and filter down quickly. And this, this worked pretty well. Um, at this point, I can take a look at this. About five minutes. Um, this is what the event looks like here inside of this. And I've got my managed images and so forth. I've got um, the registration information here. So users, it's been selected that users can register for the event. Once you've got registrations, you can't turn it off. Because what would that do to your registrations? Right. So we've got that going. We've got uh, the ability to, to make manipulations to this if you want. If you do the registrations, then you get something like that. So we've got a number of, of, uh, of states that things can be in. Give some information about what's going on in that comments in here. You can even hold tickets if you need to. For any reason, you want to say, I need, whoa, uh, President's office just called, and I need to set aside 12 tickets. You just do it and put a comment in there as well. So um, you can download them in a, in a CSV format um, and, and import them, use them in the regular ways. So that's our, our nascent registration system. But once we're in here, I'll just take a look at some of the other aspects of this. In the administrative client, you're, you've got the things you would expect inside of a calendar system, such as the title, um, date and time manipulation, whether it's an all day event or not whether the event recurs, and there's some pretty complex recurrences that can be that can be handled in here. So maybe it, hand, it uh, repeats until a specific date, but only on Mondays and Thursdays, and that kind of thing. So you can set up complex recurrence rules that, that come out nicely, and that's true in both the administrative and the, and the personal side. Um, you've got descriptions which are required in the admin client, any cost if you want to have it here. Expensive, and you can obviously associate it. You can associate a, a link to to a website, whatever you got. Images that could be managed and, and thrown up in, into there, which you can point at just a simple URL, which is what I did here. I originally uploaded the uh, this zombie picture, and it will automatically generate both the image URL and the thumbnail URL. Then you can just go back and manipulate the choose or overwrite them. Um, Locations and contacts are are controlled in the system so that you get a long list. You just pick the ones you want. And um, down here at the bottom are what we call topical areas. And what this what these actually are is a tagging mechanism that runs through a calendar hierarchy that then has categories associated with it. And what this allows for is hierarchical category tagging. So if I tag something as concerts, it's also being tagged as arts. And if I tag something that's like a music department um, or something special down there, it'll go all the way up through schools and departments and maybe up through its uh, various systems. So you get these long 
categorizations, which is nice. But just doing one click, it's also clicked as arts. So maybe the arts, you know, school of arts, humanities wants to pull all of the arts information in one place. But uh, you know, the music department maybe, or or somebody else is only interested in concerts, or a user is only interested in subscribing to the concerts. So you get to be as fine grained as you need to be, but you get all of this uh, this hierarchy built in as well. Over tagging is good. So that's that. Um, I'm pretty much out of time, so I can show you anything you want to see. Is there uh, any final thing you'd like to see? I, I've not shown you a whole ton of this stuff, but there's a lot to see. I'll show you quickly a uh, calendar sharing just for fun. Stop me if you want to do something else. Here's a feed builder. I, I will stop here for a second to show you this. This is kind of a cool thing where you can build up feed widgets. One of the plans that we have for a future version of 3.10 is that um, these feeds, this is great for an administrator or a departmental admin who wants to quickly throw on a, a, a widget onto a website, right? So if I'm building a widget, let's say it's only going to be the, you know, the current day, say, then one day. And uh, we don't want to have any limits uh, on the number of events. Well, sure, why not? We'll actually limit it to five events. And we can throw a title on it, um, or we can also you know, or not have a title. And all that stuff will show up. Uh, we can include selected categories only. For example, I'm only interested in concerts, right? So there's that. <coughs> and ultimately, all you have to do then is copy this code and paste it into a location you're done. And it'll produce the stuff there. So that's pretty cool. All right. So calendar sh sharing is as simple as this. Um, if I want to share my work calendar with somebody else, oh, here's my zombie part because I subscribed to the concerts, I can uh, manipulate this and I'll check out my work calendar. And I want to share that with uh, somebody else like Ben Franklin. I go ahead and share it. And I come down here and I can see that its status is pending because it's now been a notification has been sent to that print. If I take a look over here, my sign in is a bit. Hey! Oh, yeah, of course. I sat too long at the time. Um, I can see that an invitation from John has arrived. So I'll see what's going on with that. Oh, he's invited me to share his work calendar. How nice. I'll accept that, and we're good. There's work now. And I did not give him right access, but he'll have read access to my calendar. Now, if that's not enough, <coughs> one can always look at the advanced options here. And uh, actually, if I reload this, I'll see that I got a message back saying that Ben Franklin has, has accepted that. There we go. But if that's not enough, I'll take the advanced options here, and I can get into advanced access controls, and things can get really out of hand really fast. But for most users, they're not going to need this. But if you're an administrative user or who needs to, to get deep into uh, manipulating the ACLs behind a calendar, you can do that, because there are plenty to work with. Um, so if you really like messing with this stuff, you can. but. Uh, of course, you just wouldn't understand how to do this. Of course, administrators wouldn't know how to do this. Once you get into apples, it's hard to get them right. So we've, we've kicked that really back to the basic options, and um, sharing is that simple. So that's that's about it. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff we could talk about, but I will uh, pull it to a close. Do you have any questions about integration, about uh, other aspects of calendar? Speaking of integration, uh, as I understand, Office 365 is not supported now. I know there was some discussion that they might. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tough one. It For is us too. Yeah. Okay. It's it, it's unfortunate, but I, I I have not been terribly privy to those conversations, and even if I were, I don't know how much I can say. When we go to the to the CalConnect um, 
meetings, especially in our office sessions, and so we have to sign up. So we can't, I can't say a whole lot about any, any specific vendors, except what's been made public, and you know what's been made public. Um, my hope is that as these standards are adopted more widely, pretty much everyone's going to, to begin to pick them up. Um, Apple already supports CalDAV whole hog. Google is talking about supporting CalDAV whole hog. And if you got Apple and Google both doing that, it seems unlikely. I mean, Microsoft's got a certain model. They've got one foot in. They come to the table, they talk, and, and they, they sometimes do amazingly good work. I'm, I'm not going to give them a hard time. Because um, remember, I think one of the things we've learned from, from meeting with, with the vendors is that their, their job is to make money and to sell their product. And sometimes you see any one of them who, who, who like to see themselves as being benign say, well, we don't mind a little vendor lock-in because we're able to, to keep people in our camp for longer. And then they say, whoa, this isn't really working that well for us, so we'll open up a little bit more. And then they'll bounce back to it a few years later, and then they'll open back up a little bit more, and they'll bounce back to it, and it's kind of a cycle. So I'm hoping that uh, that most most of the, of the actors are going to actually be, be coming down this road in the long Like I said, though, um, you, you don't even think about this with regard to email, right? You get an email client, it just works with whatever system that you're, that you're working with. Um, as you can imagine with scheduling and things like that, uh, some aspects of calendaring are pretty complex. Um, but I would I would expect that, that calendaring clients and systems will hopefully be as interoperable as, as some of the kinds of stuff. I guess the question becomes then, is there any discussion of beadwork supporting other formats beyond calendar? Uh, like what format? Uh, was the format for Microsoft? Was it? Office 365? Or was there any? I'm sure. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a binary response, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, the Beaver calendar system you know, has, supports the iCal standard underneath it, and then it supports the other standards that are, that are widely accepted. If it's a widely accepted standard, you know, the ITF or Oasis, we're going to support it. That's what we do. Um, if it's if it's a vendor specific stand, you know, like it's it's standard just to that vendor. That is um, it depends it's, on the vendor. True. <laughs> if, if it's vendor centric, like that's absolutely true. Because sometimes become de facto, some things become de facto standards. Um, then probably not until it's part of you know the discussions at, at CalConnect and so forth. We we will not support it. In fact. Here, to that point, rich text. Wouldn't rich text inside public events be awesome? And that's what we really want. You want to be able to have this stuff show up on the websites or show up in your, in your clients, you know, with pictures and, and formatting and all that stuff. You cannot do it because it's not part of the standard. However, there are discussions to that end, and we help have those discussions with the standards bodies. Everybody agrees on it, and guess what? Oracle is doing it, and Apple is doing it, and we're doing it, and everybody's doing it, but we're trying to do this across the so that's, that's my sort of caging answer to your question. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you very much. I know it's late.